Hello fellow teachers, this is Ben Wilcox and welcome to Teaching with Power. I look forward to spending some time with you today studying and learning from Ether 12 through 15. I am so grateful for all of you in this community for your commitment to deepening your understanding of God's Word. So thank you for allowing me to come into your homes and share my love of the scriptures with you every week. I hope I can share with you some methods and materials that are going to help you to teach insights from the scriptures to other people in relevant and meaningful ways. And as usual, if you're interested in lesson plans, PowerPoint slides, or the handouts that I make, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those resources. With that said, I invite you to grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. I like to begin a study of this section with the following discussion question. What is the purpose of an anchor? In nautical terms, an anchor is a large, solid hunk of metal that holds a ship steady in shifting waters. When stability is needed, an anchor can be dropped into the unseen realm below the surface of the water to secure the ship to a fixed point. And even though you can't see what the anchor is connecting to, it has a very visible and real effect on the vessel floating above it. An anchor is absolutely critical to the safety of those on board, especially in rough waters. Now to someone who enjoys rock climbing, or rappelling and canyoneering, like myself, the word anchor brings up a quite different connotation. An anchor is what secures you to the rock. It's what you connect your ropes to and place all of your weight on as you climb or rappel. Your life literally depends on the quality and stability of the anchor and your connection to it. Now for the metaphor. If your life was likened to a boat on the water or a climber on her rope, what's your anchor? And that question is deliberately open-ended. There are many different facets of the gospel that could be compared to an anchor. And allow your class to share some examples of their anchors. However they decide to apply that metaphor, you can transition to the scriptures by saying something like the following. The prophet Ether drew on the image of an anchor to teach us something about navigating the stormy waters or the cliffs of life. Can you find the word anchor in Ether chapter 12? And it shouldn't take them long to locate it in verse 4. There, Ether introduces us to what he considered to be an anchor to our souls. And the importance of this anchor becomes even more pronounced when you consider the setting of the chapter. Actually, the double setting. You have the Jaredite setting, and you have the Nephite setting, as Moroni translates and comments on the Jaredite record. Both Ether and Moroni societies are on the brink of total collapse, and both prophets have been compelled to witness the absolute worst of humanity. And a few weeks ago, I told you that the two themes that seem to dominate the final three books of the Book of Mormon are the fullness of iniquity and the living righteously in a wicked world. Ether 12 through 15 fits nicely into that framework. Shining out of this bleak setting comes the ray of light that is Ether chapter 12. These two prophets are going to teach us how to get through turbulent and wicked times. So what was this anchor that Ether talks about in verse 4? I'm going to label it with two words, two words or ideas that really dominate this chapter, and see if you can find them. The first word is going to be the most obvious. It shows up 35 times in the chapter, and you'll see it in the following verses. And be aware that in a number of these verses, it appears more than once. The word is faith. And then we have word number two. Can you find it in these verses? And it doesn't appear as much as the word faith does, but I feel it's equally significant in this chapter. That word is hope. Faith and hope are the backbone of this chapter. For the purposes of this lesson, I'm going to basically use those two terms interchangeably, as I believe that they are basically synonymous. 
I'm sure that somebody much smarter than I am could probably really parse out and separate those two definitions well. But certainly, the two are deeply connected. Faith is almost always defined in terms of hope. In fact, here in Ether 12.6, Moroni gives his definition of faith. And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. There's more to faith than just belief. It's also hope. There's a chronological aspect to it. It's hope in future things, future blessings, future promises, future prophecies. And in the scriptural sense, hope is more than just wishful thinking or desire. Real hope is something that drives you and motivates you to action. We act on that hope. I hope and expect things in my future if I maintain my current course of righteousness. With that in mind, I like to read Ether 12 looking for what I call the three hopes. And you could just as easily call them the three faiths if you'd like. These three hopes together constitute what I feel is the anchor of the soul. Each hope is going to help us remain fixed and steady in the turbulent waters of the last days. Or if you prefer the climbing anchor metaphor, the three things that will hold you fast and safe to the rock of our Redeemer. Over the years, I've taken many youth groups rappelling, and uh, the church's standard of safety requires a three-point anchor, when I normally would only use two. The church wants us to be extra safe, and these hopes will keep our souls extra safe as well. They got Moroni and Ether through their stormy and dangerous era, and they can do the same for us as well. And you can see these three hopes interwoven and overlapped and linked together throughout the entire chapter. As you study, imagine that each hope is like a pair of glasses or lenses through which you read the entire chapter. And each pair is going to bring a slightly different message into focus. So let's begin with lens or hope number one. I like to introduce the first hope in verse four. And do you see a hope in there? Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. The first hope is hope for a better world. And the world being referred to here is the celestial world, even a place at the right hand of God. One of the things that will help us most to remain steadfast through difficult and turbulent times is the assurance that they won't last. There's a better world waiting for us out there in the future. This fallen world has an expiration date. At one point, it will undergo a glorious transformation. Article of Faith number 10 says that we believe one day the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. That hope for a better world in the next life can pull us through the most difficult of circumstances. Something that helps us get through a really tough week of work is the knowledge of an approaching weekend. Something that helps us to get through a demanding semester of school is the knowledge that summer vacation awaits just around the corner. We can stand the pain and discomfort of the dentist's chair because eventually the appointment will end and our teeth will feel better because of it. And something that helps us to get through the challenges of this life is a belief in a spirit paradise, a future millennial reign of Christ, and hopefully celestial glory. Those future realms are things that we can't see right now. We can't behold those worlds with our natural eyes yet. We have to have faith in them. We have to have hope for a better world. And in that light, now read Ether 12.6. And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because ye see not. For ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. 
And in this sense, or through this lens, the trial of faith is life. It's mortality. The witness of a better world will come after that trial. Therefore, we should not dispute the existence of a spirit paradise, a millennial reign, or a celestial glory, because we can't see them. If we have hope for those worlds that aren't seen, one day the witness of them will come after our trial. Now skip ahead to verses 32 to 38. Where do you see the hope for a better world in these verses? And in verse 32, Thou hast said that thou hast prepared a house for man, yea, even among the mansions of thy father, in which man might have a more excellent hope. Wherefore man must hope, or he cannot receive an inheritance in the place which thou hast prepared. There's a phrase in there that I deeply love. The prophet speaks of a more excellent hope. This hope for a better world isn't just a good hope. It's not just an inspiring hope. It's not just an excellent hope. It's a more excellent hope. As far as hopes go, this one takes top priority. We must have that hope if we wish to weather the storm. God has prepared a place for us that is better than this one. And verses 33 through 35 speak of Christ's role in preparing that place. He laid down his life to make it possible. And he did it because he had charity. And we're going to speak much more deeply about the role of charity when we get to Moroni chapter 7. And there, Moroni is going to return to that idea and really flesh it out. So I'm going to wait until then to dig deeper into that incredibly crucial topic. But then you have verses 36 through 38. And these three verses are going to have great significance in church history. This is the Lord's response to Moroni's pleas that the Gentiles would have charity. God's comfort to him is that it wouldn't matter as long as he was faithful. His garments would be made clean, and he would one day sit down in that glorious place that had been prepared. Well, it's these same three verses that are going to provide somebody else with comfort hundreds of years later, in 1844, when two brothers are sitting in a jail cell in Carthage, Illinois, awaiting what they know to be their impending death. Those two brothers are, of course, Joseph and Hiram Smith. And in that very dark and discouraging moment, where did Hiram turn to find solace and comfort? Ether chapter 12, verses 36 to 38. Doctrine and Covenants 135, 4-5 tells us that Hiram read these three verses and turned down the leaf of the page. And you might remember Elder Holland's dramatic use of that moment in his talk defending the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, as he held that very copy of Hiram's in his hands. And you could say that part of the comfort of that verse comes in the knowledge that his garments were clean from the blood of his generation. But another part of that comfort could come from the promise of being able to sit down in the place prepared for him in the mansions of the Father. Hiram found hope in the promise of a better world than this one. That promise comforted him in his darkest hour. And now for all of us, this hope for a better future world can help to keep us afloat in the choppy seas of life. Whenever you find yourself tempted to give up or sink into despair, may this promise of future glory and rest make your vessel sure and steadfast. Now, as wonderful and comforting as that hope is, there's another related one. And we mustn't cling to one at the expense of the other. What happens if all I do is hope for a better world in the next life? Does this life just become pointless drudgery? A thing to be endured? Do we walk pessimistically through mortality, just getting by and hoping and dreaming for another world in the next life? To my understanding, that was the mentality of the dark ages of Western civilization. Nobody was living for this world, or hoping for this world, or trying to make this world any better. It was all about looking forward to the heaven 
of the next life, some future bliss and blessing, or just avoiding hell. Earth was fallen, miserable, and beyond repair, and there was no vision, no optimism. It wasn't until the Renaissance that mankind decided to begin trying to make this life better, to make this world meaningful and more worth living in. Hope number two, then, is hope for a better world here, a better terrestrial world. Back to Ether 12.4, those that hope for a better world in the next life and in this life will live a certain way. It makes them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. That hope for a better world here will lead us to good works here. And starting in verse 7 and proceeding until verse 22, we have a really fun section. We're given a myriad of examples of people who demonstrated that faith and hope for a better terrestrial world. You've heard of the Hall of Fame, right? Well, here we have what I call the Hall of Faith. Example after example of individuals who had the faith to act on their hope of something better and the miracles they experienced because of it. In 12, 7 through 22, find all the examples of the miraculous things people were able to do and experience in this life because of their faith and hope for a better world. In verse 7, the faith and hope of the Nephites made it possible for them to receive the visit of the Savior, allowing them to experience that amazing fourth Nephi-type world of great happiness in this life. In 10, faith brings the priesthood into our lives, making this world a better place. Alma and Amulek, Nephi and Lehi, Ammon, all believed in making this world better through the teaching of the gospel and made a better world for thousands in the Book of Mormon. They had the, some would say, foolhardy notion that even the hardened Lamanites could be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they found success in it. In 17, the three disciples believed so much in the positive destiny of this world that they wished to live forever on it until its miraculous future change. In 20 through 21, we see that the brother of Jared was able to see Christ in this life as a mortal. In verse 22, we see that the very Book of Mormon itself was brought forth in the latter days as a result of the collective faith of many Nephite prophets, believing that it could make this world better for future generations. And then the portion of Ether that really got me thinking about this, this second kind of hope hope for a better world, actually comes in chapter 13. I always thought these first 12 verses seemed a little out of place, a little tangential. But in light of this second hope, it makes perfect sense. Moroni starts commenting on Ether's prophecies of the new Jerusalem, the holy city of the Lord that would be built up in the last days. Article of faith number 10 again. We believe that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent. Now, both hopes are expressed in these prophecies. The new Jerusalem will not be perfected until the millennium, when, in verse 3, it should come down out of heaven and the holy sanctuary of the Lord. But there's work to do before that perfecting and finishing act. Verse 6, And that a new Jerusalem should be built upon this land, unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. And then even more particularly in verse 8, Wherefore the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old. And they shall no more be confounded until the end come when the earth shall pass away. So there is building to be done before the end cometh and the earth pass away. This idea of building Zion, or the new Jerusalem, or an ideal society, is going to inspire Joseph Smith and the early saints and motivate much of their sacrifices and work. They saw themselves as the builders of the latter-day Zion, the new Jerusalem. 
once Joseph received the revelations that we find in Moses 6-7 through that describe the city of Enoch, the church became intently focused on doing the same in their time. The Enoch story really looms large for Joseph. And this is where we see the establishment of the United Order as a means or an attempt to implement the law of consecration. This is where we see the purchase of lands in Jackson County, Missouri, and the plans drawn up for a city of God. They called it Zion. We, as modern members of the church, still believe that Jackson County, Missouri holds an important future for the building up of a literal Zion. However, we also see the fulfillment of those prophecies in the building up of a Zion worldwide through the stakes of Zion. The missionary work we do, the chapels and temples we build, the activities we plan, and the example we set are all done in the spirit of making this world a better place. In one sense, right now, we're building the new Jerusalem. This hope for a better world seems to be almost inherent in the souls of all men and women. Even in the worst of situations, there's something in the human soul and heart that hopes for and believes in the possibility of something better. It's part of who we are. You would think that after thousands of years of war and violence and crime and abuse and holocausts and slaughters and wickedness, that we would have this idealism beaten out of us. And we would all become pessimistic skeptics that just accepted the reality of a miserable world. But we just can't seem to collectively shed this belief in and a hope for something better. And there's ample evidence of that spirit all throughout history. Sir Thomas More even gave that idea of creating an ideal society a name. Utopia. Many groups, uh, religious and secular, have aimed to create such a place. The Shakers and the Amish, for example. And out of English literature, you have the myth of King Arthur and the founding of Camelot. And that idea is going to inspire the Kennedy administration as they saw themselves as the creators of a new Camelot in American society. In fact, politicians have often drawn on this spirit of idealism to boost their campaigns. The New Deal, the Great Society, even Make America Great Again are all examples of politicians attempting to tap into that spirit. And then think of popular culture. What are some of the biggest and most popular movie franchises of the last 30 years? Star Wars, Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings. What is the major iconic theme behind all of them? Well, they're all set in a dark and foreboding time when the forces of evil are dominating and winning. But then, a small group of determined and good and idealistic people that are dedicated to each other and their cause band together to fight it. And through great sacrifice and against all odds, they triumph in the end, overcoming evil and establishing an idealistic time period. There's the defeat of Sauron and the return of the king in The Lord of the Rings, the vanquishing of Voldemort in Harry Potter, and even though it ends like six different times, the overthrow of the emperor in Star Wars. In fact, the name of the very first Star Wars movie is Star Wars, A New Hope. It's evident that humanity believes in and connects deeply with that idea. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ, our manifestation of that belief isn't fiction and it isn't out of reach. We believe in the reality of the creation of that kind of society. We're striving to build it now and we look forward to its completion in the future, in the millennium, and the transformation of this earth eventually into the celestial kingdom. This desire acts as an anchor to our souls. It keeps us sure and steadfast and always abounding in good works now. And we need that spirit of progress and idealism, both societies and individuals. Heaven help us if we ever lose that hope of creating a better world. 
hope number three. And so far, we've talked about hope in collective terms. Societies, nations, the church. But what about you as an individual? You could read this chapter through the lens of your own personal life. What can you hope for? For this section, I'll give you a number of verses to examine, and you can approach this with a handout as well. I'll make it available for download. Your students will read the following verses looking for things that they as individuals can hope for and exercise faith in. Each verse holds a key to that hope, and each is a part of the anchor. Ether 12.4 again. You can find hope for a better world for yourself in the next life and in this one. If you can connect yourself with that anchor of faith and hope, then it will make you sure and steadfast and always abounding in good works and will lead you to glorify God. Ether 12.6, you can find hope in receiving a witness as an individual after the trial of your faith. Rest assured that if you are seeking an answer to a prayer, a witness of a gospel truth, or heavenly guidance, at some point, and according to God's wisdom, it will come. They who ask receive, they who seek find, and they who knock have the door of God's witness opened to them. Ether 12, 8 through 9. You can find hope in the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? Take a look at verse 11. The gift of his son. And how do we partake of that gift? That's a worthwhile question to ponder. Is it by emulating Christ? Is it by applying the atonement in our lives? Is it by living his teachings? Any way that you see it, we would do well to ask ourselves if we've partaken of that gift. It will certainly yield great blessings. And then, speaking of verse 11, you can find hope in the more excellent way. Do you remember how earlier we talked about a more excellent hope in verse 32? Well, pair that idea with verse 11. What brings us a more excellent hope? Following a more excellent way. It's a more excellent way than the law of Moses. It's the higher law, the way of Christ. Jesus Christ himself once said, I am the way. Christ's way is the more excellent way. And his way provides us with a more excellent hope. And traveling his excellent way with that more excellent hope, I'm certain is going to lead us to a more excellent place. A place on the right hand of God. Ether 12.18, you can find hope in miracles. We as a church do believe in miracles. God manifests his power in special ways to those who exercise hope and faith in him. I've seen miracles before, things that cannot be explained away as coincidences. If what you desire seems impossible, you are still allowed to have hope in it because miracles can happen. Ether 12.19, you can find hope in one day actually beholding the things that now you only see with the eyes of your faith. And isn't that a beautiful promise? There are things that you can't see with your natural eyes. They exist only in the realm of our anticipation and the eyes of our spirit. But one day, we'll see those things in reality we will actually see Christ standing in front of us, inviting us to touch the tokens of his sacrifice. One day we will actually see the loved ones that we've lost and hold them in our arms once again. One day we will actually be clasped in the arms of our heavenly parents. One day we will have all that we have believed in gloriously confirmed with our actual eyes. And we will be glad and we can find hope in that future happiness. Ether 12.27, you can find hope in overcoming your weaknesses. We discussed those verses a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. We all have areas where we wish we could do better in. There's talents and gifts that we desire that seem to come so much more easily to other people. There are temptations that we wish we were stronger in denying. 
we have imperfections that seem to continually nag at us no matter how hard we try. We can have hope in the fact through our humility and faith in God that those weaknesses will eventually not only be eliminated, but actually made into our strengths. We can find hope in that future, better version of ourselves. Ether 1230, you can find hope in your ability to move mountains. Here is a literal fulfillment of Christ's teaching that man can move mountains with faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, if you take that teaching literally, it really doesn't do much good. How many people in this world are going to find themselves in situations where they're going to actually need to move a mountain? But if you interpret it symbolically, which is how I believe Christ intended us to interpret it, we all have mountains in our lives. Mountains of responsibility, of obstacle and challenge, of doubt, of work, of hardship. With our anchor of faith and hope, we can move those mountains. We can overcome that massive trial. We can climb over that challenge. We can dig down that doubt. And we can accomplish that colossal task. Ether 1237. You can find hope in Christ's power to make you clean. It mattereth not what other people think or say or do. Christ's atonement and mercy and love can make you clean. God promises that he will remember our sins no more if we repent. It will be as if we never did them. If we're willing to turn fully to Christ, we can and will stand before God pure and perfected. Just look at that list. We've got a lot to hope for, don't we? We need not despair nor become discouraged with ourselves. This life is a journey, a process, a progression, a learning experience. We're not meant to have it all and be all and attain all right now. So please be patient with yourselves and with life and with God. We've got to do as Nephi taught back in 2 Nephi 31.20. We must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope. I believe with all my heart that if we do this, all that we hope for, all that we desire, all that we believe in, will be brought to fruition. A few questions to consider asking. What aspect of spirit paradise the millennium, or celestial glory gives you the most hope. What are you doing now to make this world a better place? And what more could you do? And which of the personal hopes inspires you the most? And how? So, yes, my friends, we live in dark, stormy, and perilous times but we need not be overcome by them. This three-pointed anchor can hold us firm, can keep us from being swept away or capsized. It can allow us to navigate and progress through the canyons of life with confidence and safety. May we never despair. There's no need to. We have so much to hope for. There will be a better world than this one in the future. A world without pain or death or sorrow or wickedness. There will be a better world in this life as we continue to build Zion and separate ourselves from the world. There will be a better you in the future. If you maintain your hope, you will be filled with good works, with a strong testimony, having experienced many miracles, with weaknesses that have become strengths, with an unspotted soul. And Though it's strange to say it this way, in the end, the Saurons, the Voldemorts, the Emperor Palpatines, the Satans will all be defeated, their dark kingdoms destroyed, and those dedicated, faithful, hopeful few that were willing to fight for goodness and light will enjoy their utopia, their Camelot, their millennium, 
and it won't be fiction anymore. Well, Ether 12 is definitely where I would spend the majority of my time in this particular block of scripture. However, there is one brief insight that I might point out from the remainder of the book of Ether. And my icebreaker would be quick and simple. I'd ask this question. In chess, what ends the game? Answer, when you capture your opponent's king. Once you have the king, it doesn't matter how many other pieces are on the board. It's over. On the other hand, a game between two very evenly matched players will often come down to just the two kings and a few pawns left on the board. The challenge is to see who can get one of their pawns to the other side of the board to be promoted first. This is a very common situation in chess and is called the end game. But the point is this. You fight until you take the king. Now what we find in the final chapters of Ether is the end game for the Jaredites. As a teacher, you may want to explain what happens to the Jaredites by summarizing these final chapters. The rival kingdoms of Coriantumr and Shiz fight until there are only the two kings left. And in quite dramatic fashion, Coriantumr ends up slaying Shiz. And for some reason, the story of Shiz's demise is a, a favorite among my male teenage seminary students. Go figure. But I often get asked why they would fight all the way down to just two people. You'd think that before that happened, they'd come to the realization of how pointless their war was becoming. Fighting until victory of what? There was nothing left to win. No society to fight for. You kind of wonder what Coriantumr was thinking when he finally kills Shiz. Was it, yay, we won the war? Or, uh, I won the war? Now what? <laughs> but maybe it makes more sense in terms of chess. You don't win until you take the king. That was their philosophy of victory. So they fight all the way until only the kings are left. On the other hand, that may make sense in chess, but in real life, it certainly was pointless. They weren't thinking and they weren't feeling at that point. And maybe that's the lesson. Something shut down their minds and their hearts. What is it that has the power to do that to people and lead them to such a tragic ending? I invite you to examine the following verses to discover what caused this total waste of human life and the effect that it had. What can motivate a people to continue fighting when it's obvious that they're completely destroying their own world? And the answer is anger. Anger and the emotion that so often accompanies it. Hatred. What effect does anger and hatred have on the human soul? The Spirit of the Lord ceases to strive with you. You give Satan power. It hardens your heart and blinds your minds. Nothing shuts down the heart from feeling and the mind from thinking quite as effectively as anger. It can lead to Ether 15 type situations where the only thing that matters is revenge and destroying the other side. Suicide bombers come to mind. They destroy their lives because of their anger and their hatred for the other side. Who cares if it ruins lives? Who cares if it destroys your peace and happiness? Who cares if it leads to the complete destruction of everything that you know and love? At least you stuck it to the other side. And I've seen and heard of this kind of thing destroying nations, workplaces, organizations, friendships, families, and marriages. Hopefully, we can learn from the Jaredites' mistake. Some discussion questions. When have you seen anger and hatred cause problems in your world? 
And what helps you to hold back anger and hatred? Well, the Jaredites lived in a deeply divided society. If you live in a deeply divided society, where you find yourself in disagreement with somebody in your own world and circumstances, don't let anger and hatred enter the equation. We can't let these things dominate or control our actions when we're divided. Instead, we can try compromise. We can try reaching across the aisle. We can try examining things from the other person's point of view. Or at the very least, we can learn to disagree without becoming disagreeable. I'm afraid that once we let hatred and anger into our lives or society, we're setting ourselves up for a pointless and tragic end. And that, my friends, is, is all that I have for you this week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I hope that you'd share the channel with somebody else that you feel it could help. I also invite you to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Leave a comment below if you like. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.